Hello everybody, the 81st Platinum competition is finally here. This competition is a math competition for undergraduate college students in the US and Canada. Usually the competition takes place on the first Saturday of December, but uh, the competition in 2020 got postponed to February 20th of this year. So for the competition, uh, there are two sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and during each session, uh, participants are given three hours to work on six problems. So this is considered one of the most prestigious university level math competitions, but it's uh, very difficult because the media score is often zero, even though the competition is attempted by students specializing in mathematics. So let us take a look at the most recent competition. I will be covering the first three problems in this video. So without further ado, let us take a look at the first problem. How many positive integers n satisfy all of the following three conditions? First, n is divisible by 2020. Second, n has at most 2020 decimal digits. And third, the decimal digits of n are a string of consecutive ones followed by a string of consecutive zeros. So basically, n is of this form. It's, it has at most 2020 decimal digits and is divisible by 2020. Okay, how many of such n? Well, firstly, I think it is quite intuitive that we'll try and factorize 2020 as follows and then figure out how what conditions are suffi sufficient and necessary for 2020 to divide n. Well, the first part is quite straightforward. It's divisible by uh, 4 times 5 if and only if n ends with at least two zeros. So that leaves us uh, to consider about uh, divisibility by 101. Now, in this case, since 10 and 101 are co-prime, we see that actually uh, 101 divides the number n, if and only if it divides the number n after we strip away all the trailing zeros. So in the end, we only need to consider what is the uh, condition that this imposes on the number of ones. And to do this, we observe that 101 divides 1111. Uh, because you have 101 and 101 add up together is 1111. And so what happens is 101 will divide uh, the string of ones if and only if it divides the same string with four less ones. Because we can remove the first four uh, ones and it will still be divisible, the, the divisibility uh, condition will not change. So that means that if we keep repeating this, it will eventually be left with either 0, 1, 2, or 3 copies of 1s. And we can easily check that uh, 1, 11, and 111 are all not divisible by 101. Therefore, it is necessary and sufficient uh, for n to first have a multiple of 4 number of 1s. And then in terms of the number of zeros, it must have at least 2 zeros. And once we satisfy this, it is necessary and sufficient for n to be divisible by 2020. So now we just need to count how many uh, such n have at most 2020 decimal digits. And this is quite straightforward. You just consider uh, cases based on the number of zeros. If there are two zeros, then there are a uh, flaw of 2018 divided by 4 number of choices in terms of how many ones to have. Then, if we have three zeros, we have this number of choices in terms of the number of ones that we can have, and so on, until we have 2016 zeros, which would give us only one choice uh, for the number of ones. And so we just sum up all of these choices. Uh, we have three of the 504 at the start, and then uh, four copies of 503, four copies of 502, and so on, and then four copies of one. And this one can be, uh, it's a simple arithmetic problem, we end up with 508536 as the final answer. So problem one uh, isn't too bad. Let's take a look at problem two. So problem two is an interesting one. Let k be a non-negative integer and we're supposed to evaluate this sum over here. So I'll present two solutions. One is an uh, algebraic solution, which uh, under the situation of a competition, you might be more inclined to come up with such a, uh, such a solution. And then I will also present a combinatorial solution, which is uh, more elegant, but it requires uh, more creativity. And under competition circumstances, it might be harder to come up with this solution. Okay, so first the algebraic solution. 
firstly, let's let's try and understand what this sum is saying. Cause for for mere mortals like me, I will need to write it out, uh, to to visualize what's going on. So, okay, this is the j equals zero term, and then j equals one term, j equals two term, so until the j equals k term. So, we are supposed to evaluate this sum. I'll let it be uh, denoted by f k. So it's a function of k. Okay, uh, just try out some small values first. So f1 is uh, basically this one is 2 to the 1, 1 through 0, and then plus uh, 2 to 0, 2 to 1. So you increase the top and the bottom choice by 1, and then you decrease the power of 2 by 1. Okay, and then this is equal to 4. And you can also work out to see that f2 is 16 and f3 is 64. So at this stage, you might hypothesize that, well, maybe fk is 4 to the power of k. But how do we prove that? Okay. So looking at this sum again, I think one of the first thing you tr we will try when you face uh, this binomial coefficient is to use the very popular uh, uh, identity where you have something like k plus 1 choose 1. You can break it down into the term where the top is 1 smaller, but the bottom is 1 and then 0. So this is the general identity where uh, a choose b is equal to a minus 1 choose b plus a minus 1 choose b minus 1. So uh, this one is a popular identity, can be easily proven, so I won't cover it. But basically, you can use that identity to break uh, the binomial coefficient into these two copies. Then you can do the same for all these copies. So k plus 2 choose 2 is the same as k plus 1 choose 2 plus k plus 1 choose 1. Uh, and so on, until at the very end, where we replace all the binomial coefficients by that uh, two sums. And then I haven't replaced this one yet, but I will, I will just leave it blank for now because uh, we will figure out what we need to put here later on. And now if we look at the two different pieces, we notice that they, the binomial coefficients follow the same general pattern as fk because you see that uh, as you move from left to right, right, the, the top term also increases by one together with the bottom term at each step. So this suggests that we can relate each of these sums to uh, fk in some manner. And indeed, if we look very closely at the blue terms for now, we see that, yeah, it follows almost the same uh, binomial coefficient pattern as uh, what I'm highlighting now. We have k plus 2 choose 2, then k plus 2 choose 2, and so on, all the way until the second last term it matches, uh, as, my, as my pointer is indicating. Uh, so actually, you can see that if we take fk and we subtract away the last term and then we divide all the coefficients by 2 we end up with the blue terms here so the blue terms is, can be written in terms of f uh, in this manner and then how about the uh, the red terms so the red terms right we see that okay it similarly follows the same pattern where the top and bottom of the binomial coefficients keep increasing by one at each step but we notice that we need a, a zero uh, something through zero term and if we follow the pattern the appropriate term to put here should be k minus 1 through 0 and indeed k through 0 is the same as k minus 1 through 0 so we can simply rewrite the first term as follows and now we see that this uh, expression here right firstly the the first all the terms here except the last term they follow the pattern uh, required for fk minus 1. So you start at k minus 1 choose 0, then increase by 1 at each step all the way until uh, 2k minus 2 choose k minus 1. So we have fk minus 1, but the coefficients are all double that of the fk minus 1. So you have 2 times fk minus 1, and then you need to add the last term back, uh, which is 2k minus 1 choose k. So we have successfully written fk in terms of uh, lower, uh, lower value terms. And this, this is a very promising uh, Headway already. Uh, so, just to reorganize things a little bit, so we have written fk as uh, follows. And then, if we just uh, multiply by 2 and rearrange and tidy up, we will get fk equals to 4 times of fk minus 1, then plus 2 of 2k minus 1 choose k minus uh, 2k choose k. Now, because we hypothesize that fk is already 4 to the power of k, right? So, this leads us to consider, is, this true, is it true that uh, this term over here is equal to 0? And yes, indeed. Uh, again, once again, we can write 2k minus 1 choose k uh, as 
two k minus one choose k minus one as well. So these two are equal. So because of two copies, I I write the two copies as this plus this, and then we use that very same combinatorial identity that we spoke uh, spoke about. Uh, where two k choose k is the same as reducing the top term by one, and then the bottom term keep and reduce by one. So indeed, uh, this expression here is equal to zero. So we prove that f k is four times of uh, f k minus one. Uh, the base case f f of one equals to four. So it follows immediately that f k equals four to the power of k. So this is uh this this isn't very hard to uh derive once you put in the combinatorial identity and then observe that this gives a sort of recurrence relation. So so after that uh things are quite straightforward. But now I want to present a a very nice combinatorial solution. So maybe you have hypothesized from trying small cases that the expression we want to prove is equals to uh, 4 to the power of k or the same as 2 to the power of 2k how do we prove this typically this is another common idea where we have something like this and then we will try to come up with a story of double counting to make sure that we can uh, prove the combinatorial identity and in this case the story is that we want to count the number of binary strings of length 2k plus 1 with at least k plus 1 copies of 1. Uh, in, other, in other words, the number of binary strings of length 2k plus 1 where there are more 1s than zeros. Okay, so we count this in two ways. Firstly, we notice that the total number of binary strings of length 2k plus 1 is simply 2 to the power of 2k plus 1. And at the same time, there's a bijection between the binary strings with more zeros than ones, uh, with the set of binary strings having more ones than zeros. And this bijection is achieved by uh, simply flipping the digits zero to one and one to zero as we move from the left to the right. Okay, so uh, this proves that uh, these two sets are of equal cardinality. So the number of binary strings with at least k plus one ones is half of this, namely two to the power two k. So we have already proven the right side uh, that, that that the number of such strings is given by the right side. Now we need to prove that it's also given by the left hand side. And to do this, we count by uh, cases. So we let case number J denote the case where the position of the k plus first uh, copy of 1 is at position k plus 1 plus J. So I have uh, the binary string, right? And because there are at least k plus one copies of one, I know that there is there is this thing. There is a k plus first copy of one. And where is the leftmost place it can be? Well, the leftmost place is if everything is one up to. Uh, finally, we see the k plus first uh, copy of one. So, uh, at the best case possible, we have all the ones, and then the k plus first copy appear at position k plus one. But we can also have the uh, the k plus first copy of 1 then appear uh, maybe at k plus 1 plus 1, then k plus 1 plus 2, k plus 1 plus 3, and so on until the, the very end. So this gives the different uh, cases. So the j case is the one where the k plus first copy of 1 appears at the position k plus 1 plus j, and j runs from uh, 0 to k. Okay, so how do we count this? Well, if we have the k plus first copy of 1 here, it means that to the left, namely in the k plus j positions, we must have exactly k copies of 1. So the possibilities to the left here, there are k plus j choose k possibilities. And how about to the right of that? To the right of that, anything goes because we already have k plus 1 copies of 1 so far. It doesn't matter what we do to the right. So the remaining k minus j digits, we can do anything we want. There's 2 to the power of k minus j possibilities there. And we notice that this summon is exactly the same as the summon we want. Uh, after adjusting that k plus j choose k is the same as k plus j choose j. So summing up all the cases, we get that the left hand side is exactly uh, the number of binary strings with the property we want. Therefore, the two sides are equal. So this is a very nice solution. Uh, it might take a bit more creative juices to come up with this, uh, but certainly not totally out of reach. Okay, that's great. Now let us look at the next question, question A3. So let A0 equals to pi over 2 and let An equals to sine of the previous term for n at least 1. 
determine whether this series given here converges. So because this is an undergraduate math competition, uh, it's expected that there will be some, I mean, it's fair game that there will be some questions that uses uh, undergraduate math content. So over here, I need to know a bit about what convergence of infinite series means. Uh, but usually for the Patnam, the undergraduate content that is uh, used is not very advanced. It's uh, quite basic uh, ideas, but you need to apply them in a creative problem solving way. So this is the same for A3 here. Uh, so what you might try to do when you see a question like this is, okay, maybe you try the ratio and root test, but you will quickly realize that this is uh, heading nowhere. So the next idea that is quite common to try is maybe you compare against a known series. So at first you might see the square here, you might want to say, can I compare against one over n square and then show that it converges. But actually, uh, once you start trying, you realize that this doesn't seem to work out and it might be better instead to try to compare against the harmonic series and show that it diverges. And so this is the idea we'll be pursuing. So this means that the idea is we should try and compare a n against 1 over square root of n so that when you square it, you get the harmonic series. Now, of course, this, uh, this is just an idea when you make it rigorous. So what we will try and do first is let us try and prove this lemma where sine of 1 over square root n is at least 1 over square root of n plus 1. And why would we want to do this? Well, because if we look at the how the next term is generated, if we can show that uh, a n is at least 1 over square root n, then we can inductively show that all, all this, uh, this comparison hold for all the terms as long as we prove this lemma. So this is how we motivated this lemma and now we can get the rigorous mathematics going. So I've written the lemma as, as shown, and the proof is as follows. So we have sine x, it's, it's quite natural to try and see how about the power series. So we write sine x as uh, this term here, this uh, power series here. And we notice that uh, for sufficiently small x, uh, the remaining terms in the red bracket here is positive because you have uh, x to the power of 5 is the sort of dominating term as x gets smaller and this is a positive term so the, the remaining tail in the red box is positive. This means that uh, sine x which has this positive uh, red box is bigger than the series without the positive red box. So this inequality holds for x sufficiently small. And then if we replace x by 1 over square root n instead then we get uh, sine of 1 over square root n is bigger than this expression here for n sufficiently large. And what we want to show is that this thing is bigger than 1 over square root of n plus 1 and we end up with a polynomial kind of comparison. So this is great. This is uh, a hint that things are working out well. Uh, indeed, we can square both sides to get this and then we clear denominators and we get uh, the polynomial com uh, inequality here. And this is indeed true because the n cubed term cancels and then we check that n square, the coefficient of n square is positive in, uh, in the left hand side. So for sufficiently large n, once again, uh, the inequality holds. So actually the lemma that we have proven is that this thing holds for n sufficiently large. So uh, actually, I think it works for n equals 1, but we will not need to bother ourselves to prove this. As long as we have this lemma for n sufficiently large, uh, we can uh, prove the main question. So let me explain how this is done. So let capital N be such that the inequality holds for N at least capital N. Then we notice that A1, which is a uh, sine of pi over 2, right? So that is 1. This is already at least 1 over square root N. And so we can use the lemma repeatedly. A2 is sine of A1. Uh, A1 is bigger than 1 over N, so we have uh, this. And then this thing is at least 1 over square root of n plus 1 by our lemma. And similarly, a3 is sine of a2. a2 is bigger than 1 over square root of n plus 1. But use the lemma, is bigger than 1 over square root of n plus 2, and so on. So we have the terms, right? When, they, when you square them, you end up uh, being a tail part of the harmonic series. So we can conclude that the infinite series actually diverges by comparing against the tail of the harmonic series. So this is quite a, a nice uh, question. Uh, that's all for what I'll be covering in this video. I've already solved 
problems B1 to B3. So that will be coming up shortly. So stay tuned, uh, hit the subscribe button and see you soon.